Hey friends, Irene Lyon here and welcome to this entire world of nervous system health and healing. Today I have a special guest interview for you with a gentleman who is named Rob Stewart. I met Rob through another podcast friend over the interwebs and I immediately was drawn to his holistic ways, methods of helping people heal their skin from things like eczema, psoriasis, rosacea, we might call this dermatitis, really tricky to heal skin disorders. I say that with air quotes, um, because as we talk about and as he, as he has shown, as I have uncovered with my own healing of my skin, these are not really diseases or disorders. They are, they are a symptom usually of something much deeper in the body. And we talk about this. This talk is long, as you may see, and it's con conversational. This is the first time uh, this video where Rob and I have met. Um, so a lot of it is just history, getting to know um, his story, where he came from, why he got into this work, what he does now with his, his students, his clients. Um, he is not a medical doctor or a dermatologist or someone with fancy degrees of healing the skin. He has studied behavioral science, yoga, and Ayurvedic principles of healing. The reason I really love Rob's approach, it's similar to mine in that each person is different. Each person is diverse in how they show up and why they might have these troubles. So as you may know, I can't tell you to heal anxiety, this is what you have to do to heal depression, this is what you have to do. The overarching theme might be work on nervous system regulation, but it's more complex than that. So what you'll find in this interview, if you're looking for specific, do this, do this, do this, eat this, 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 detox, this, 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 we won't offer that to you um, because each person is different and individual. But what does happen in this talk is he talks about the general themes that he sees in his clients and his students and how he himself healed his significant skin troubles that started um, at a young age. We go into things that occurred to him when he was five years old where something started to spark his immune system and we go to current day what he does. Um, again, I wanted to have him on because I know many of you ask about healing skin because you know that was what I healed from or what I healed significantly and I can't be an expert and teach everyone everything. Therefore, I wanted to have Rob on just in case you or someone you know is struggling to heal their skin. Um, we talk about the dangers of topical steroids um, and also the benefit of mindset and having strong routines. Enjoy this talk. I thoroughly enjoyed talking with Rob. We could have talked for another probably two hours, but we cut it. Um, uh, we might have another talk at another time. What I want you to do is if you are feeling pulled to learn from Rob or learn more about him, definitely follow him on social media. He has great Instagram videos and YouTube clips and look into his work, look, in, look into his programs, his coaching practice. He is a perfect example of someone who has healed difficult skin troubles. And the other thing, his site, go over there and look at some of the stories of people in his world who have healed intense skin disorders skin troubles. Um, it goes to show that we can do so much healing when we have the right tools, the right education, and the right practices. Enjoy this conversation. Rob, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Irene. It's, it's great to meet you. And um, uh, just a little chatting we've been able to do before recording has been uh, nice to connect so far. Yes, I think we'll know each other for a while. That's my sense. Awesome. That's my sense. Um, I'm going to start this off completely different than how most people do podcasts and interviews where there's an expert. I'm going to ask you off the top, what do you offer people? What do you do for your business career? And then we'll get into your story. So let people know where they can find you, what you do and what you offer. Cool. So uh, what I do is actually hard to explain because I'm thrown into the category of a um, skin health expert, which I don't consider myself to have anything to do with the medical industry. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a certified nutritionist. I'm super proud of that. Um, what I am is I'm a, I'm a, I have a degree in behavioral science. I've done master's work in psychology and, and uh, 
philosophy. Uh, I'm a yo certified yoga therapist and, and my specialty is not the asanas and the breath work. It's the philosophy behind the eight limbs. So truly what I call myself is just a destroyer of assumptions. Um, and what I do is I, I help people get very concrete on what their self-limiting behaviors and beliefs are mm -hmm. and create behavior change models so that they can either you know, work two hours a day and make 10 figures or heal their skin or become extraordinarily muscular and energetic or, you know, still have a boner at age 80 and have good sex and be able to dance. So I, I, I tend to work mostly with people who have eczema, dermatitis, psoriasis and rosacea. Um, mm -hmm. And I have two kind of offerings for that. I have an online course community, which has been really fun, actually really thriving. Um, the members are all just dope people. Everyone's kind of just in it together and um, yeah. we're all exploring, we're all learning and um, I'm kind of steering the ship, but I'm, I have my white belt on the entire time. I stay in that learner mentality and I experiment, I learn and we all just share and it, it's, it's awesome. Um, I also work with people privately, you know, people that really, really want to get serious and um, have that kind of intensity to be like, okay, like, whatever needs to be done, we're going to do those people end up coming to me and, um, we get their skin healthy and we get their, their life back on track. And, um, everything's all in my links, uh, holistic health activation.com is my old, old cheesy website, um, where you can sign up for coaching, um, and consults and heal psoriasis and eczema.com is the course where you can access the group and, and all of the videos and all of that stuff. Super. So you know that I have a bit of a skin journey and some of my followers know that. Um, and because of that journey, I get questions a lot and I don't consider myself a skin specialist. And yet I've healed a great deal. If you look at how I was 10 years ago, it's very different. I still have little flares here and there, but nothing the way it was from birth really was was my thing and if i look at my baby pictures which i haven't shared to the public i might in the next little while for some reason it wasn't until just earlier this year really earlier this summer rob uh we were moving and i was moving all the old photo albums that we used to have as you know <laughs> i don't know what age you are but we have lots of photo albums i'll be 44 next month all right we're in the same gen so i'm 48 next month and i had this impulse to look at my day one, you know, pictures. And for whatever reason, I saw finally how inflamed I was, how red my skin was, how inflamed my eyes were. I had patches already of what we would consider eczema at day one, which means I was baking like that in my mama's tummy. And, you know, we'll get into this because a, a lot of people are like, well, is it toxins? Is it metals? Is it food? Is it genetic? Is it curable? Blah, 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 blah. So we'll get into that. But it's a concept. The skin is so important because it is our barrier. It's our protector. Um, and it expresses what's going on inside that isn't right. And I had um, a teacher. I want to share this with you and then I want to, you know, we'll get into talking about all the things. Her name is Kathy Kane. Many of my followers know her. She taught me how to do the work that I do with early trauma, touch work, getting into kidneys, adrenals, gut, brainstem, working with deep survival stress patterns. And she said to me one day or to the class, and I was struggling with a lot of rashes then, she said, I always get excited when someone comes in with a rash because we can see it on the outside. And I even remember she was like, oh, goody, this person's troubles are on the outside so I can track and I remember just hating her because I was in so much discomfort but now I understand what she means because you can track the changes and so with that how when did your skin present to you an issue like what is your history of I mean your skin is glowing and gorgeous and clearly you're not inflamed what was it like 20 years ago? Were you a kid that had skin problems like myself? Let's hear your, your history. So similar to you, I had issues as a child, but they weren't showing up yet as 
eczema, dermatitis, psoriasis, or rosacea. I yeah. was the typical ginger boy living in a tropical environment. My, my parents, I was born in Charlottesville, Virginia. When I was one years old, we moved to Okinawa, Japan, um, and literally we're living on base. My dad was a, a Marine mm -hmm. and our backyard was a jungle. Um, yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm from the generation like you where our life was, there's the door, get the hell out, go have fun, come back if you're about to die and or for dinner. And Hungry. so, you know, I was out with my older sisters just having a ball and always brushing up against some type of plant that was giving me a rash. Um, one of the famous childhood stories that I have that my family always loves to tell, um, we used to take those big blue tarps and put them on the side of hills, get them soaking wet and slide down them, you know, pre slip and slide era. And I loved anything physical. I still do. I just love to get after it. And one day I was just going down that tarp and sliding and having a great time. And all of a sudden I can still vividly remember the feeling because it, it came back later on in life with the eczema and stuff. Like I was being stung by a thousand bees everywhere. And my sisters looked at me and they were like, Oh goodness, red hives all over my body, mm. rushed me home. You know, first thing my parents do is, is stick me in a shower um, and turn the water on. And as soon as the water hit me, it was like the intensity went up times 10. So I'm, you know, this little, little dude covered in rash, um, bawling my eyes out. They take me to the emergency room. Okay. I don't know what they gave me, but they, they gave me something. Um, maybe it was Benadryl. Maybe it was some type of steroidal shot Cortisone, Not, yeah. yeah something um and it, it knocked down the inflammation but from then on i always had some sensitivity towards grass um and and plants and and being not all the time but it would just pop up mm -hmm. then around uh eight and a half years old i started having sore throats a lot and I also noticed that at that age, I, my sternum, when I would play sports, would get really hot, like really, really hot. And I'd itch it. I'd itch it so much that sometimes it would, it would bleed a little bit. Wow. But for me and my family, that was like, yeah, we're, we're gingers. We're all gingers. Like, that's your skin. Like, whoop de doo You're fine. Yeah. And um, nine years old came around and I, I got strep throat 11 times in one year, got my tonsils taken out, um, you know, missed tons of school, tons of school, tons of school. And I believe that's a, the straw that kind of broke the camel's back yeah. and really started my process down autoimmune, immune and skin weirdness. Um, through middle school, nothing crazy, you know, was pretty lucky. Mm -hmm. But I did always notice that the sternum thing was there. And then I always noticed I always had a little dandruff and my, my scalp would get, you know, I'd play football and put my helmet on and it gets it be Moist. so itchy, itchy yeah, yeah. And, and just gnarly um and that kind of lasted until late middle school i my chin just was turned red like straight bright red my face was this color my chin was red and i noticed it and i was self-conscious about it but you know mm -hmm. back then again my parents we're kind of old school. They're like, you're going through hormones. Like it's no yeah. big deal. And it wasn't yeah. even the type of thing that I even complained about. I just, it just noticed it. Then through high school, the scalp became a little bit more, um, now looking back, obvious, probably subderm or psoriatical, uh, eczema something. Cause I started getting the chunks and the funkiness and the, mm -hmm. the flare ups and it would, it would be normal. And then it would come back. And that was it for high school. Kind of. Um, my senior year hit mm -hmm. and, um, during baseball season, um, I was in probably the best shape that I'd been in. I'd worked out really hard mm -hmm. to get ready for my senior year. I was being heavily recruited by major league baseball and by every division one school. I went, I went to this crazy powerhouse school called cathedral Catholic down in San Diego. And it, it was just highly competitive, highly stressful, um, and with that came protein powders every morning, creatine, all the supplements that I could, you know, figure out to eat. Plus, uh, my school wasn't near my neighborhood. So I was on my own. I was driving to school. I was going mm. to school all day, playing my sports and then coming home eight at night, um, having a late dinner, doing my homework and, and going to bed. So my yeah. 
diet turned pretty horrible. It was fast food. It was burritos and tacos and Jack in the box and in and out as much as I could get in my system. Cause I was trying to be big and yeah. strong to play sports. Yeah. And I ruptured my kidney six game, six game of the mm-hmm. season sliding into home plate. My ribs bent up into me, ruptured my kidney. And f- that was a whole story in and of itself. Um, after I recovered from that, my face was pure red for a year. Wow. Until my freshman year in college, it was just my body would be this color mm-hmm. and my face and my face alone, not even my neck would be a dark maroon, almost like a intense wow. sunburn without yeah. being sunburned. Yeah. My scalp itched then. And again, it was just kind of like we I never went to the dermatologist for it. Never, yeah. you know, we just kind of was like, yeah, whatever. And then I went to college and things somehow, despite getting way worse with my, my habits, you know, I, I, yeah, my diet was horrible and I was, yeah, I was, I was, um, you know, I've always been, uh, an experimenter and a a risk taker. So college for me was like, Oh, let's drop acid before a division one baseball game. Hell yeah. That sounds like a good idea. Um, yeah, I, I went there and, and so I, I had the scalp stuff still. And then every once in a while I'd notice some like weird red patch, but it would, It'd kind of be there and it'd flake off and then it would go away. Mm -hmm. Um, That ended. And then by 23, 24, 25, the psoriasis and eczema started really, really showing up like Mm -hmm. in obvious, obvious ways. By 25, 27, it was the pictures that you see. It's, it was my whole face, armpits, crotch, back between the toes, in the fingers, behind the ears, in the ears, in the nose. It was just everywhere. It was fully systemic. And the flare up cycles were coming faster and being more intense. And um, that's when I started really going after it with doctors, you know, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I spent all the money I had seeing doctors traveling to different specialists. And I, I can vividly remember this this moment because it was life changing for me. I, I went into this really well known dermatologist in San Diego, and his nurse practitioner came in and he looked at me and he said, "Looks like you have AIDS. You should probably get tested and left." And that that's when I knew that the system was completely fucked. That I needed to have nothing to do with it, and if if I was going to figure this out, it was going to be on my own, completely. And for about the next. 10 years dove headfirst into every possible alternative healing methodology that you can think of from breatharianism to natural hygiene to fruitarianism, everything. I tried it all. I did it all. And the one thing that I was smart about was I went to uh, finally got online because I was really late to even the internet. Um, Didn't have a cell phone until I was 30 um, got online and I, I figured out that you could access Harvard's book collection from mm-hmm. online. So I went to their, I went to their doctrine program and I basically stole all of the old medical journals from the, like the 1930s and forties, like when the medical industry was actually legit, like they yeah. were doing real science, politics real was not involved. And I found that unequivocally everything that they said was like, all foundational practices like you, your digestion is related to your skin and your filtration system is related to your skin and your thoughts and your brain and your emotions are related to your stress and your stress is related to cortisol and your cortisol. Is, I kind of started to put it together. Um, mm-hmm. And then at that point I was studying yoga therapy mm-hmm. and kind of working slowly on a master's degree and at a school that doesn't even, it's not even around any anymore, but it was like a very super liberal psychology college um, called the Human Development College of Encinitas. Um, and it, it kind of became very obvious what my mission was. And that's what started me down the healing path. Do you remember, was there just like you had that turning point when the doctor said you have AIDS, which shame <laughs> on shame on them. Yeah, that was pretty, pretty bad. Um, <laughs> what a way to knock someone's soul out of their bodies yep. body um what was one of the first practices or shifts that you did where you felt and saw a noticeable difference when you were on this self-diagnostic journey 
Yeah, that's a that's a good question because I spun my wheels big time yeah. for probably from age 25, 26 till almost 29, um, mm-hmm. getting worse and worse while thinking I was really nailing life because comparatively I was. Looking back, I was just throwing spaghetti against the wall with alternative practices. Yeah. Uh, it was just it was just experimentation. And yeah. it wasn't until um, the year that I healed, which is I, I'm not a person that has calendars or knows my That's date okay. or anything, but um, it took me about a year to heal. I was about 11 years ago. Um, so I was 32, 33. And that year, I can remember the start of the year being like, OK, like. And I excused so many drug and psychedelic references. I don't, I don't generally okay. talk about this this much, but I was, I was, um, on acid on the side of a mountain and completely doing the, the feeling, the oneness and seeing the flower of life and the pixelated universe and feeling connected to all beings. And something hit me that basically was like, you need to just systematize your entire life. You need to put the, uh, some diet together. You need to put the cleansing and detox together. But you also can't abandon the emotional and the athletic and the nature and that end of it. When when I kind of realized that and then actually started taking the steps in all of those categories, mm-hmm. I started feeling different, really different for the first time. I started feeling more calm. I started yeah. feeling more confident. I started having more energy. I started sleeping a little bit better. I started um, enjoying the company of a different type of person. I I started to enjoy my solitude a little bit more. Um, My skin wasn't really budging. Um, But the moment that really that you're asking about happened at almost the exact six month mark of my year that I healed. And I actually told this story on uh, Instagram a couple days ago or last week. Um, I woke up in the morning. And instead of doing my natural routine, which was to go directly to the mirror, pick at my scabs, you know, get the crap out of my hair, like comb my body, you know, get myself not looking like a leper and presentable because I was teaching yoga then, you know, so it was like this really harsh thing to like be someone who's supposed to be helping people with their health. And I'm, I'm looking the way that I look. So I was trying I, that that was my routine. Go to the mirror, deflake, yeah. um, lotion up and steroid cream up and that didn't happen i walked to the shower i took a cold shower i did my meditations um i had a workout i taught some yoga i came home and realized like i i haven't even checked obsessed about it yeah i haven't even checked and i realized in that moment that i'm i've gotten to a place where what i'm obsessed about right now is this feeling and the solution and these mm-hmm. steps and this different type of life that I'm more interested in now than the life that I was pursuing before that. Mm-hmm. And I got to a place mentally where if my skin didn't heal, I was fine with it at that point. I, mm-hmm. I had completely let go, which made a huge, it, it was like a burden lifted off of my shoulders. It was, um, it felt like literally a backpack of, of bricks just off boom i was like liberated and i was like okay this if i feel like this and my skin's not great this is at least a life worth totally living like Mm. i don't like the way i look but i like my life Mm -hmm. and it it seemed like from that moment the healing sped up and i started having way more progress with the symptoms and you fast forward to about the the year mark um and i was able to take on the flare-ups when they'd come and go it it didn't become this life horrible depression Mm -hmm. thing it was like okay having a flare-up i know what i need to do i got you know do my salt baths i do my cold exposure i do my sauna and i bring my practices to a more mellow place i spend more time in nature i talk to my mentors and it worked you know it, it it worked and and finally right about the year mark um I had a real interesting experience with a coffee enema that released. And there's another controversial thing Uh, to me. I I just call it what it looked like. It was a giant trash bag looking thing that was mucoid plaque. It was black. It was long. It was stringy. That thing came out of me and it was almost symbolic. Like that was the last demon. Like that was, that was (laughs) it. Um, That came out. It was really weird. Yeah. And then my skin had the weirdest, biggest flare up ever. 
I, like month I watched, 11 and a half. I watched that. I think it was a video you shared that about yeah. the coffee, like your skin had healed, the coffee enema. That thing came out clearly junk that was just embedded in your intestines, in mm -hmm. your colon, probably. Yep. Yep. And then continue, please. And then rapidly, you know, much, much faster than any big flare up had ever gone away. Mm -hmm. It was just, it was gone. It was like the signal from the autonomic nervous system, that inflammatory response, fight or flight, that was just beating itself to death all the time for no reason. Just was like, I've had enough and I'm, I think I'm cool. And that was 11 years ago. Like that's, and, and I was, I'm one of the lucky ones because I haven't dealt with like relapse or flare ups or little mm -hmm. things here and there. It's like my skin from that moment has progressively gotten better and better, better and better and better and better. Um, and you know, I think that people hear that story and, and sometimes, um, it actually throws them off because I don't like using the word cured because it's a, it's yeah. a meaningless word. It's like there's levels to it and it, it, it depends on where you're at and how far you want to go. And mm -hmm. to me, I think that every single human being who has this issue can definitely be in a manageable place, can definitely have skin that they're happy to be in. And for some people, they can take it all the way and cure the disease. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, the, the gains and the healing are out there for whoever wants to take it. But it, it takes some work, you know, it takes some yeah. consistency. And for me, it, it more took a lot of shifting of my perspective. I want to go back to that first story of the slip and slide in Okinawa. Do you have an idea of what triggered that reaction? Have you I ever... Was yeah, I was told by the doctors that I have a, had an allergy to certain bugs that lived in certain grass. And, and um, you know, they, I, they said I had an extreme allergy to anything in the flea fam family, mm. um, which is funny because I live on a farm. I get bit by ticks. I, you know, I'm around bugs and nothing happens ever anymore. So yeah. I don't know exactly the, the, the nice cocktail that, that brought that out of me, but I do know that I was a C-section baby um, mm -hmm. and, and I hear that coming up a lot. So that might have been part of it. Um, my mom was smoking cigarettes before she had me. Um, mm -hmm. Luckily, my parents have always eaten semi good and been mm -hmm. movers and shakers themselves. Mm -hmm. So I had a healthy mom, but not perfectly healthy. And she had two of her kids C-section. So she had some thing that wasn't perfect with the way that she delivered babies. So that yeah. obviously shows there's some level of genetic and autoimmune and yeah. mother's stuff being passed on. Yeah. Um, and I think to um, living in Okinawa, Japan, I think our diet got a little, little off, a little weird compared to living yeah. in Charlottesville. And then when we moved to San Diego, um, it, it was just, a, it was just different, you know, and yeah. it was, if we would have eaten the local way, we probably would have been good to go, but you know, living on base, it's cafeteria stuff and probably lots of canned foods and yep, and that's processed. You you actually nailed it. The one giant mistake that my parents made, and this was just because it was the 80s and 90s, and everyone was thin and sugar wasn't really a thing. Uh, Pepsi, Coke, Dr Pepper, yeah, it was stocked in our fridge, and it was you had access to it unlimited. So I was a literal soda addict as a three-year-old, four-year-old, right. I was wow. drinking all the time. Um, right. Right. So I have a feeling that that was the main um, mm -hmm. driver as far as mm -hmm. diet goes. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. pure poison. Um, it is. Yeah. So I, that's my guess. That's my guess yeah. as to some of the factors, but I don't know for sure. I don't know for sure. It's interesting because it sounds, did your sisters have any trouble with their skin? It sounds, or. So my sisters did not have problems with their skin in that way but my sisters have had other things my my oldest sister um she is 55 um and she wasn't able to have children you know uh. so she had some reproductive things and uh, maybe and that's the genetic thing for my mom or whatever um and she has taken it upon herself to i mean she's a beast you know like yeah 
uh, I tell her like, okay, Amy, like you're running sprints now for your workouts and she'll run sprints in her backyard in the snow before she goes off to sell real estate. Like she's a boss. <laughs> so she's super fit and she's, her skin is, is great. Um, my middle sister, Katie, who mm-hmm. is like the wild typical middle sister, um, she has great skin, never had skin issues, but she has had every single thing, you know, everything, everything pop else. up that you, like reproductive system. She's yeah. 54. It's yeah. been taken out. Um, all, all sorts of things. Mm-hmm. Um, pancreatic, you know, got her pancreas taken out. Um, it, it's just, she's, she's had a lot. So it's shown up for her in those ways. Mm-hmm. And it showed up for me with my skin and, um, yeah. So luckily none of yeah. them, but my mom has, developed at an older age rosacea on her face oh yep and she's been able to kind of nip it in the butt just with some little changes luckily right yeah the thing that came to my mind and i'll just share it in in case it's useful might not be for you for someone else i wonder if in that environment there was um chemicals pesticides on that grass um you know back in the day my mother's dorm rooms were sprayed with ddt in the philippines yeah. Um, my dad has stories of being covered with that stuff. He grew up on a farm. Um, I know he had some skin troubles too. And that maybe this is a good way to go into the toxins because I want to get into food and I want to get into mindset. But what's, I mean, I just mentioned that. Does that ring a bell? Or it's like, no, I don't think it was that. It's a strong possibility. So it was a Marine Corps base in Japan. And so yeah. all of that stuff was utilized throughout the entire military. It was also a really crappy plastic tarp yep. that was soaking wet with my body sliding over it over and over and over little micro wounds. I'm, I'm sure Tears. that there yeah. was a, a combination of many things. And, and the fact that you bring that up is definitely something I've thought of. It's like, okay, it could have been as simple as fertilizer, you know? Um, yeah. And I, I think that it, it has way more to do with that. Um, and, and mm-hmm. probably a mild case of some weird plant toxicity allergies. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I that that would be a, a fair guess, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, there's a concept in at least the nervous system healing health world, and I'll just name it for those who know this, and then I'll let you know about it, called the, the stages of neuroplastic healing sequencing. Norman Doidge kind of popularized it in one of his books. He's a psychiatrist, MD, that talks about neuroplasticity. And my work, for example, is focused on regulating the nervous system, differentiating the nervous system from that trauma somatic lens. But the first stage of neuroplastic healing sequencing, he would say, is cleaning up the neurons in the glia. And by that, he means getting rid of the toxins, replacing you know, bad water with healthy water, making sure you're moving, making sure you're not eating foods that you have allergies to, if allergies even exist, you know, it's hard to know if those are accurate or not. Um, And so that first stage, from what I've seen, is one of the more important ones for skin. It doesn't mean that stress and trauma doesn't contribute. Right to the skin someone can have an outbreak when they go to college and it's super stressful and they've changed nothing but it does feel as i heal my skin and have healed it those toxins and i know you talk about that a lot are key so how do you teach your people what are like your top things about the toxins in our environment that you ask your students without fail when you work with them yeah, so I don't even I don't even get into the the, the micro conversation of what toxins are and toxicity. It, it right. it's way more general than that. It's do the foundational practices first, and for most people, they get ninety percent healthy. And but the foundational mm-hmm. practices for many people are very very challenging to do. You know, it has to do with behavior change and consistency. Mm-hmm. And as you mentioned, some of the most basic foundational practices are like detoxifying your body and enhancing the body's autophagy through manual practices, whether that's sauna or cold exposure or cleanses like coffee enemas or the salt flush. Those are some very basic ways to kind of start Mm -hmm. that process, but Mm -hmm. also how much you move, um, how much muscle you have. Like the, what I'm finding now Mm. is that muscle lean muscle mass is probably the most neuroprotective, um, 
it's the most immune protective nervous system protective thing that we have i mean it, it just changes the the whole relationship of the mitochondria to everything sugar mm -hmm. fat yeah. protein yeah. everything so first the foundational practices are that you, you got to eat whole foods healthy yes. untoxic foods whatever your belief system is whether you lean more towards animals or more towards plants the golden rule is for me with my clients is if it has a label and there's more than one thing on it, don't it, don't eat it period. Right. At least in the beginning, you, you, yeah. you can maybe learn the rules yeah. on a deeper level, but at the beginning, whole foods only non the, the, the most well-known toxic foods that are, are healthy, probably remove those as well. The basic level of cleansing detoxification practices, which are also kind of like the ones that, create meditation and mm -hmm. mindsets. They're the one and the same. All this to me is the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. um, they're all the, all the practices lead you to the same truth, whether it's the diet, whether it's exercise, whether it's the meditation, whether it's the mindset, whether it's the cleansing. And then water is a huge one. You know, I was yeah. lucky enough to almost accidentally, right as I was really taking off with my healing, I, I was living in Mount Shasta. So I was drinking headwaters Spring from water literally volcanic spring water bubbling up from the i was showering in it was bathing in it i was mm. drinking it only and that made it that made a huge difference um yeah so it's water it's your food it's your yeah. environment also you one of the things that it's the hardest to to really navigate for people and and this is when you kind of have to have extra emphasis on the other things is your environment you know you live in the mm -hmm. suburbs or you live in a city mm -hmm. compared to you know living on a mountainside there's a lot going on with fumes and EMF signals and light and the things that are in your house, you know, household cleaners, even the, the materials that the building is made out of. You know, I, I'm a, I build for fun and it's very hard to find non-toxic building materials. Yeah. You know, I use metal yeah. so much more than I ever thought I would because it, it doesn't rot. It doesn't mold. It's clean. It's, it's clean and it, it works really well. And it, uh, luckily, I kind of like it stylistically, but people would be scared to death what's in their walls. You know, yeah. they'd be scared to death. Well, it reminds me of recently we renovated a, a home and paint, new drywall, new cabinets. The first night I tried to sleep there, I couldn't sleep. My system went into a full on stress response. Didn't sleep. Um, and I said to my husband, I can't, I cannot sleep here until this scent is completely out. And I have more sensitivity to that because of whatever, because of my, my upbringing, because of my in utero environment, my skin, um, the exposure to chemicals that I had, all those things. Cause he kind of felt it the first few days and then he kind of got used to it. Um, but he was also breastfed and had whole foods growing up with a hippie mom and all these things. So there was just this different robustness in his immune system. If he ever gets a quote unquote cold, he's over it in two days and I'm, you know, hacking a week later. Um, but it's true about the, the, the building, um, uh, materials and also, um, things that people just don't think humans are impacted with. So I'll share this. I saw an image of a cat on Facebook who was bleeding from its nose. It was dying. And it was a story of these people who had this cat. And for whatever weird reason, it just slowly started to get sicker and sicker and sicker. And the vet's like, we don't know what's going on. And they're like mourning their cat dying. It stopped eating. When an animal stops eating, you know, something's not right. And what they traced it back to is the, the, the husband had bought some plug-in air fresheners a month prior, plugged them in. Of course, they're all at ground level. So the cat's at that level. Of course, the cat is also a much smaller being. And the moment they unplugged them within hours, the cat perked up. So when we think about toxins, often these things that are just readily readily available in the supermarket oh they're just fun scents you know to make things smell sweet but um and i try to really educate my people on this you gotta throw that shit out 
huge one. That is that is a huge one. Absolutely, our household cleaners, uh, yeah. our laundry detergents, the the candles. You know, the Yankee Doodle the Yankee Doodle candles that Essential. you have are destroying your life. Literally, yeah. you know, yeah. you go and you know. I see like my sister. This happened a few months ago. Uh -huh. um, my sister. I was over at my sister's house, and she was finishing getting ready, um, and she had come downstairs and I'd went upstairs and she had done the whole thing, like the, the candles and the bath and the eucalyptus and all this stuff. And I'm sitting there, like I go in there and instantly I can, I get hit with it. And it, I'm sensitive just because I'm pretty in tune with how my body's reacting to things. Mm -hmm. And I went, I remember just going downstairs and, and like is all in the garbage. Boom. Like <laughs> my sis, like seriously, like this is like, and I don't mean to be an alarmist, but like this, I, I call it like these are straight cancer right here. This is yeah. these are cancer sticks. Like this is, yeah. this is no good. Like if you want me to, I will give you natural things that smell wonderful, that mm -hmm. smell way better than this, that mm -hmm. will linger in your house and create an atmosphere of healing. Mm -hmm. um, but it ain't it ain't those. <laughs> no, and I I so one here's another story. So recently. We were in, uh, at a place in Italy that we had been to five years ago and there were no scents. I know there weren't because I often travel with my own sheets, right? Just in case. Mm -hmm. And we went to this place and I'm like, what happened? All the sheets were scented. They had the sticky things that have the oil that are just horrendous. So much so that all the drapes in the in the place were infused with that scent. So my husband, who is amazing, you know, he takes everything down. We literally hide it on the deck. I took the sticky things and put them out. Sorry, tree, put it by a tree like 100 years yards over. But we had to go into the local town to buy new sheets and towels. Because we asked the, the establishment, do you happen to have non-scented sheets? And they had no idea what we were talking about, of course. And then they said, well, we have a private laundry for our staff. You're more than welcome to wash those. And, we're, and I know, and you know, and now everybody else knows, if that stuff has touched a detergent, it's ruined. It doesn't come out of it. And so, you know, we went and spent way too much money on new sheets, towels, pillowcases, um, for myself, him and the girlfriend we were traveling with because we're very sensitive. But what that lets me know is most individuals are not picking up on that because, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, they have so many toxins within them that it is not a trigger because it's in their systems and they've become, we could say, immune to those scents. Absolutely. I mean, it it can sound to probably the the new person a little woo, you know, yeah. like or maybe even super woo. But a huge, huge part of my practice um, as a teacher and as a coach yeah. is watching people develop a sensitivity to what things are happening in their body. People ask me all the time. They say, well, does this food work or does that food work? And I say, ask your body. Listen. I say, ask it. Eat and, and watch. And at some point, the people I work with and a lot of people in the course or even the people that are just following people like you and me and that are doing the same type of work, you do get to a place where it's almost like when you smell BO on yourself for the first time as a teenager, you know, and you're like, yeah. Whoa, what is that? This is strong and I got to do something about it. Um, yeah, it, it hits it hits me obvious. You know, I, I, I walk into places and. Luckily, I am in a place where if I sleep on the worst sheets ever and put on a jacket that is washed in the worst detergent ever, nothing happens to me. You're there, okay with it. No reaction response whatsoever. Um, I, I, you know, I got COVID. Um, I don't remember what strain it was, but it was the second strain that was supposed to be super gnarly. And it was yeah, like, I got a yeah. little runny nose yeah. and that was it. I was, yeah. I was good to go. No problem. So I'm. I'm lucky that my immune system, my nervous system really bounced back. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I actually attribute that to once the healing started happening for me, mm -hmm. I took things to another level. Mm -hmm. I didn't go, okay, I'm good and kind of go backwards. I went, yeah. 
I want to feel this way and even more and even make it more robust. So mm -hmm. I, I do see people that, you know, I, I when I do an intake with somebody, here's something I get all the time. I eat super clean. I'm a super healthy person. I, I, I work out. Okay, cool. What does that mean? Well, you know, we da, 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 and then pizza Thursday nights. And then, you know, Saturdays, of course, it's game days. So, like we have some beers and like it's, it's we Chips. just have a we have a cheat day. And yeah. OK, so, you know, and I'm not judging people's habits. It's not what I'm here to do. Like life should be fun and being mm -hmm. social and enjoying mouth pleasure is mm -hmm. kind of a part of being human. So I'm mm -hmm. not trying to be robotic or a giga chat or anything like that. But, you know, your behaviors tell the tell. And that that then I'm like, OK, so that's a check mark and not eating clean from yeah. my standpoint. Yeah. Then I say, let's let's talk about your hygiene habits and, and things in your house. And they go, oh, well. You know, I, I do all the stuff my dermatologist told me to do. I have like, yeah. you know, the, the Dove um, soap and I use like the, and, it, and it's just the obvious yeah. bunch of things. I've been, okay. Yeah. And I am always asking incense, candles, you know, um, those oil things that, you know, oh yeah, I love those. Those are so great for bath time. And I'm like, okay, there, there's a, there's a place where we can, you know, get some Improve. gains happening for you yeah. really quickly. And, and you start to see that a lot of people just don't know you yeah, know they, they, know. they know. just don't know on paper if they walk 30 minutes three times a week you know like the fdaa says is what you're supposed to do and if if you're generally cooking at home no matter what you're eating then you're you're knocking it out of the ballpark um and part of the job that i hate is being <laughs> like the bearer of bad news where it's like yeah. people not even close like not yeah. even freaking close yeah. like yeah. So it, yeah. it's, um, it's, uh, you're, you're dead on, you know, you're dead on. I often, my husband will often joke, but it's not a joke. He'll say it takes a lot of work to not be poisoned in the current day and age. And, um, one of the things that frustrates me and I'll just say it because I think we probably will commiserate with this is someone wants to know, and it might just even be a friend. You know, if someone's paying you, you have a little more of a, you know, there's more justice to actually give some direct advice. Yeah. Um, but the loved ones, it, like your sister is a great example. And it sounds like you just swept in with kindness and like, no, <laughs> this isn't good for you. Right. But when people start to hear the things that myself and my husband do with making our own broth and making our own soup and not eating vegetables that aren't grown within, you know, a hundred kilometers of where we are. And yes, I want to have that avocado in the winter, but I'm not gonna, and I want to, but I'm not gonna, and not having the canned stuff, even though it's more all these things and all the candles are beeswax because I love candles, but they're local. I've made sure that the wicks aren't filled with lead and arsenic. It seems so nitpicky. After time, though, and maybe you'll you can share some stories of your students where they resisted. But after a year or two of getting rid of these things, you do start to feel your body is in a completely different space and place. And it has the capacity to do the health healing, the autophagy, which you mentioned, all these things. Um, what have you seen in your most successful students, clients whom struggled at the beginning with all these practices that are just Western life, really? Yeah, uh, probably myself is uh, a better black and white version sure. of that. So, you know, as a division one college athlete, I thought I was working hard. You know, mm. we had the weight room at 4am. And then we had to go to class and then practice at two. And, you know, it was, um, it was for me at that point, like a rigid schedule. Um, mm -hmm. And I, and I thought that at that time that was so hard. And then fast forward to the year that I really healed myself. I was like going for a walk every day and doing like maybe one healing thing every day, like cold exposure or sauna or something. Mm -hmm. And then and then on top of that, a, a quite a bit of yoga and probably my saving grace then was dancing. I was oh. I'm, I'm huge into dance, contact improv lyrical jazz hip hop like i'm a dork i'm a straight up dance dork i love cool. it love it love it love it so at least from that standpoint i was getting my movement amount bigger and bigger and bigger mm -hmm. 
you you fast forward to today and i don't say this braggadociously because it's it's not it takes no discipline i am not a disciplined person and i do not like hard work Mm -hmm. so know that that's the framework i'm coming from Mm -hmm. minimum per day i'm moving my body six hours that's amazing easy peasy but also what people don't consider movement is when i'm doing breath work in the sauna for an hour that's an hour of movement like that sauna and the heat shock protein and the way my body's responding to it is probably on, on a deeper level than Joe Schmo who goes to the gym and does bench and squats. Um, and it's completely checked out of his body. Completely checked out of his yeah. body. So the things I don't like doing is my resistance training. It's so boring to me, but that's my work. I get in the gym, I knock it out in 35, 40 minutes and I get the hell out of there and I go to breakfast. I mm-hmm. eat my breakfast. And mm-hmm. so I make, I make my rituals extraordinarily fun and I... I make cheat codes, you know, like, so for instance, I live on a farm, I build all my own stuff. Okay, well, what does it take to actually build the way that I build? It takes me chopping wood and carrying logs and pulling things up ladders. And it's, it's exactly what humans have been doing since we were humans. Millennia. Millennia. So Mm -hmm. a quick workout, a little cold exposure, which the cold exposure for me is not a, it's not a, it's fun. It's fun. It's not a stress anymore. Yeah, it was, I yeah. was actually doing a podcast yesterday and, and we got talking into drug addiction and all these things. And it's like, I don't need Adderall or cocaine because I have cold exposure. <laughs> um, you know, it's like, I don't smoke weed anymore in any way, shape or form because I hit that sauna at night Me and either. I'm stoned beyond You're recognition. Yeah. It's it's way better than any, any weed has ever been. Yeah. Um, and so there's two tricks. One is stacking movement and things that are actually fun. Sport, recreation, hiking, nature, swimming, paddling, building, gardening, cold exposure, sauna, Mm -hmm. lifting weights, rollerblading, skateboarding, playing the drums, playing the bass while standing Mm -hmm. up, walking at your desk. Mm -hmm. Once you start to kind of learn these things, your body craves them like crazy. So it stops being hard work and you look back at your week and you're like, no wonder I sleep well because I I literally moved seven and a half hours today. You know, I did... Only three hours of sitting work and the rest of the time something was happening. Um, And I I truly believe um, my clients that that end up really, really thriving, they figure out those same strategies for themselves that make moving as much as a human really should move Mm -hmm. a part of their life in a in a non white knuckle way, because I I am a firm believer in. It doesn't matter how healthy you eat. If you hate the food, it's not doing you any good. No. And if you're going through life and you're like, I do, I wake up at three and I cold exposure and then I, I do affirmations yeah. and then yeah. I journal and, and you're stressed and you hate it. look on your face, mind yeah. you. Right. Ah. <laughs> right. Like, like I, I remind people like, I don't think that's really serving you. You, you yeah. might, you might like my morning routine. And here's what my morning routine is. When I wake up somewhere between 4.30 and 7.00 no alarm clock, just Mm -hmm. when my body is done sleeping, I get up. I go and I make green tea and I put raw local whipping cream in it. And then I sit and I listen to Willie Nelson, same album every day, and I snuggle with my Mr. Tuna. He's my little kitty cat. And then after that, and that takes like 20 minutes because I I have a, I'm really into LPs and albums on vinyl. So one, one side of a vinyl, you know, side B on the, on the Waylon and Willie album is only 15 minutes long. So yeah. it's like I drink my caffeine. I, I'm like this purring little rad feral boys hanging out with me and like looking at me and we're vibing. Yeah. Yeah. Then Social I go engagement. And, mm-hmm. Yeah. Then I go knock out the gym and the gym for me is when I go into town and I talk to the local people yeah. and I see the same people and it's community and it's, it's not, I don't love lifting weights, but it's something I I have to do. It's medicine. It's medicine, total yeah. medicine, and it's also I it makes it easier because I get to go see these rad people. I get to see the the sweet lady that is at the front counter every day who is so nice, and I get to see the same five really fit older dudes who are super inspirational, and I see the the heavier lady who's dropping weight all the time, probably before work, and it's like it's beautiful you know and it's that's not work and i think when people really make things easy it's it's a game it's a game changer and there's there's a lot to it you know there is a lot to that you know not everyone has 
total time control. Um, but even that, at the end of the day, is a bit of a choice as well. It is. Um, and what I, I like what you just said about going to the gym and connecting. I mean, let's just put some of the lingo of the nervous system. You're sparking up the ventral portion of your vagus nerve, which helps calm the heart. It keeps us connected. And I just, I just taught this to my students a few days ago because a lot of people live alone. Um, they have no family because their family's so toxic. So they're doing one, you know, they're getting rid of those toxic people, but they, they're not ready for a relationship. Maybe they don't want one, but I say, go to the, go to the deli, order, a, order a cup of soup, you know, talk to the, the cashier. If they've got some funky earrings, comment on them, like have a little, it doesn't have to be this eye gazing contest with someone mm. at a retreat. It can be right. these little tiny things. And if you find someone who's say elderly on the bench or out, say hello, you know, that little nod to someone who doesn't speak to a lot of people, you'll feel that empathetic field heart connection. And that's little healing medicines all throughout the day. Absolutely. So I Absolutely. love that you just mentioned that because I also enjoy going to the gym. I grew up in gyms. My dad played squash like every day. So I was always there jumping around on things. And then of course in the fitness world, I was a trainer, all those things. And now we are I'm living more rural. So we have a gym within our home, which is fine, but there is this craving of wanting to watch the people and what they're doing. Cause you get to know the people. It's kind of interesting. Like, Oh, that person's doing that same thing. That's bad for their back. Oh, well, at least they're here doing something, <laughs> you know? Yeah. The little rituals that you allow in your life are, are huge. When I lived yeah. in New York city, one of the most toxic places you can live. I loved it. I lived right on wall street and every single day at, at around the same time I'd walk and I'd get this, only place that had green tea lattes that would make them the way I wanted. And it was these super Puerto Rican, it was like five ultra lesbian Puerto Rican chicks. And it was like, they were badass New Yorkers. Right. And we got into this ritual together where they saw me every morning. And for like the first month, it was like, you know, Who's wait in line queen? with the rest of them. And then by the end of my time living there, it was like, Whoa, there's white boy. Here's your green tea. We had it ready for you. And I knew their names and like I asked yeah. about their kids and like that five minutes of connecting with them made me blow up. Exactly. It was just, and it's just little things, you know, and I, I, I think the power of ritual in our daily routines, mm -hmm. you get to pick that as a human. No one yeah. tells you, you know, you might have to be somewhere from this time to this time, but you get to pick the way you set up your routine and and I really think there's powerful in leveraging that. And, and like you said, whether it's, you know, joining a chess club or a book club or taking it to that total level of going to a retreat and, and doing tantric eye gazing and whatever it is that you feel comfortable with and excited about, or even just little things like going to the deli and ordering soup and having that interaction with the owner all the time. That's that's what humans have to have. Yeah. We have to have that. If yeah. without that, I may go so far as to say that the healing will be really challenging. Maybe, yeah. maybe a big part of the pie missing that may hold you back from really healing. Yes, sir. And I find that with all of the practices and, you know, you've mentioned the big ones and I do them sauna, cold exposure, exercise, movement, free dance movement, social engagement. Um, so those routines are important. And the interesting thing, and I'll share this, I was against routines up until about three years ago. I don't know why it was just my little, you know, resistant self. I still did things, but what happened is when I started to become, mm, one could say more active online and more energies were coming at me day in day out. I started to sense the more spiritual side of attack, you know, and projections from people I'm never going to meet and I could feel it and I was getting help with this. And that's when I had to have a morning grounding. It's I'm so glad I met the Sarah Kleiners and the Carrie Bennett's and the Corey Gazvinis who I've learned from and have interviewed. It's like electrons, mitochondria, sun, morning sun, noon sun, all. And it's just like, it's kind of like this geeky thing, but it's like those 
things actually make a difference when you prioritize them. And then, like you said, you wake up and you can't imagine not having them. Right, right. And even within that, there's some fun language and vernacular to play with. Like the fact that you didn't like routine meant that you were in a routine of not being in a routine in a way. And it's like the person, like I'm the guy that everyone who knows me knows Rob hates rules. And I'm, I'm literally <laughs> writing a book called the, the Rules for People Who Hate Rules. Um, and, it, and it's like we are we have that dichotomy within us. And I, I think that, you know, it's almost like when you just allow the human to be a human, mm-hmm. we kind of do actually kind of crave some level of routine. Yep. Um, and, and, and when we give it to ourselves, feels a little easier because I, I was very similar, like routines, give me a break, a schedule, hell no. And, and then I just looked at my life and it's like, oh, I go to Starbucks every morning and get a double latte and a croissant. That's a routine. Mm-hmm. It's just an unconscious one. Yeah. Habits and routines. Yeah. And and uh, that's, yeah, that's cool that you've been able to consciously figure out a few things in your morning that really allow you to like, yeah. Uh, like sink, sink back in and chill back out and get focused and calm because what a good way to start your day. It makes a difference. And some days, you know, maybe I stay in bed a little longer. So I might only have 15 minutes on a good day. It's more like an hour. Yeah. You know, but that 15 and minutes is magic. It's it's enough. Um, I want to go back to the muscle thing. Yeah. Um, because a lot of uh, those following me have what we would classify as chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, very low capacity, very low aerobic cardiorespiratory capacity. And I've done a few, again, for those listening who are new here, I've done many talks on the importance of muscle mass, muscle strength, and power. That was actually my master's degree is I put older adults from 65 to 85 through high intensity resistance training for 12 weeks. And what was found, and in the literature review, and this was in 2000, so we've known about this for a long effing time, when you have strength and muscle mass preserved or increased, all biomarkers improve. Not just the strength, not just the bone density, but the mental capacity, kidney function, liver function, all of it improves. So for some, so someone might be like, Hey Rob, seven hours a day of movement. There's no way I can do that. I get that. I'm not moving seven hours a day right? and you have to start somewhere. So for your clients who might fall into more of that chronic fatigue, really low capacity, what do you suggest to them as a way to start moving? So they're not a dropping themselves back into more fatigue but it's still offering some some uh, biochemical, cardiovascular, musculoskeletal benefit. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful question. I, mm-hmm. I love, 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 love this question. I always take a two-prong approach. One, yeah. let's check in with perspective and what you mean by movement. Like, okay, seven hours of movement on paper, you're thinking of a guy who is training for triathlons. And I'm never breaking a sweat half the time and I'm enjoying myself the whole time. So one, it's Mm -hmm. understanding what the scope of what is resistance training and what is just movement. And people, when you lean more towards movement, you can start to also get into the category of fun and play. And so I think positioning your, your, your brain as like, how do I play more is a Mm -hmm. good start for people. How do I do something that's physical, that's, the funnest thing I can think of doing, you know, if you like to roller skate, okay, start roller skating more. Yeah. You know, if you, if you used to bowl, join a bowling league, um, any, <laughs> anything that gets you off of a chair or the couch and you're standing up is a huge plus, a huge plus, even the, the, and this is not even a little thing standing up half the time when you're working, if you have a desk job, and you stand up half the day compared to not, your body's going through a drastic physiological change. Yeah. So a little switch in perspective can actually make a big difference. Um, and then for people that are in that place where they are, everything hurts, there's no cardiovascular health, mm-hmm. lifting a single weight creates so arthritis. Yeah. Um, 
you you start where you're at, right? You mm-hmm. you start where you're at. Buy a buy a trampoline at home and do 20 seconds per day, mm-hmm. and then that 20 seconds turns you know after a month into a minute, mm-hmm. right? And then six months it's 10 minutes and you're walking. Um, mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. just little, never underestimate the power of a baby step. Yeah. It's it's always for me trajectory over result, and it's about making it easy and fun, and mm-hmm. then making the volume naturally open up then Here's from the next, there go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. I, no, I was no, just no, gonna going to say I'll, i won't forget one thing also that that is really basic is like okay if you are that person who has never lifted a weight you've never done resistance training it's super intimidating to you you know look around your house see that that jug of milk pick it up walk around yeah put it back in the fridge there's your workout you just sure yeah you see that that cup up there open the pantry, grab it, put it back a few times, do it with the other hand, shut the pantry, workout done. Mm-hmm. The workouts in the gym are only simulating with yeah. resistance what humans naturally do. Yeah. That That's truly it. And yeah. the gym only is really there because as humans, we don't have the need to constantly be out killing prey, Hunting, pulling it gathering. back, climbing things, putting things in the ground and, and having to use our physical body as a tool mm-hmm. to survive. Yeah. And, and I think that those, those things, even for an 85 year old woman who has never worked out in her life, she can do those things. Oh, yeah. And once she does them in a week, that jar will be different. It's like, okay, oh, yeah. I, I, I started with five. Now I can do 20. Cool. Mm-hmm. And then once you have that first gain, when you realize you're getting stronger, physiology takes over. You start getting the dopamine. You start getting the the um, you know the I don't know if it's called winner's theory, but when when you have a win, it makes you want to have more wins. You know, it's it's addictive. So, yeah, that that's that's my that's my role. Cool. That's what I what I do it. Yeah, you don't underestimate the power of picking up a kitchen chair and walking around your living room with it and putting it back down in good, you know, squat posture. It's, there's so many ways and you're right about the gym. Cause a lot of people are like, I don't like the gym. It's inside fluorescent light. I get it bad. It's not all the best, but even a couple times a week, the research has shown you don't have to be in there for five hours, 20 minutes. I think when I, when I, um, split out the actual time, my subjects were working out, when we were doing the intervention, they were there for an hour because there was social time. We had to do a warm up for the ethics, you know, all these things. But the actual time they were pressing the leg press, which is all we did, by the way. Wow. It was less than two minutes each week. And their markers of mass and strength just skyrocketed, fat decreased. But what happened, and I couldn't write about this in my research study because it was anecdotal evidence, so it doesn't count, which I hate, was that they were coming to me with these stories. I vacuumed Irene and I didn't have to pause. This one kind of suave older man, he had a motorbike and he was so happy that he could push it like into his garage finally rather than having it stay on the street. Mm. Like just these little tiny things that a research study wouldn't hear about, but that is the part of their life that is completely changing is huge. Absolutely. Absolutely. What I wanted to ask, because this happened to me, how are your clients, students, when the sweat hurts? Let's go back to skin. Because when my skin was at its peak, it actually hurt to move because the clothing on my skin would hurt. The moment I would sweat, I would like scratch my skin off. So what do you do with your folks who are at that level? Um, Because I did, I lost all my muscle mass over two years. I bought a pair of uh, John Fluvog boots during that time. Um, I have them. I can't even get them up past half of my calf because I was so skinny and I'd lost all my leg mass. so what do you do with your folks with this issue? Because I'm sure it comes up. Yeah, absolutely. And even on a minor level, you know, when, when I bring up sauna and people are like, I, yeah. it, like, that's not happening. Like, I can't even take a warm shower. It hurts. And I, I've been there. For me, the, the winter 
was easier on me than the summer. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'd enter my hot car that's been sitting outside and it was devastating, like literally devastating, like a million bee stings, itchy. You, yeah. you know what I'm talking about? The yeah. prickles and the everything. Horrible, horrible mm-hmm. sensation. And I don't think there's a need to tough that out and push through that. Yeah. For some individuals, you know, it depends on the personality type. For for some people, it's like just go in the sauna and do it anyway, and then they break through something. Mm-hmm. Um, that's kind of like more of a medicine, like a plant medicine way of looking at it. Like mm-hmm. you got to get sick to get well. Mm-hmm. For certain individuals, toughing it out and just being a hard ass works. But I, I that, that's not needed. And, and for me, it's always start and do what you can. Yeah. And and there are ways to to get the job done. For for me, I was really lucky that when I was in that state of mind, I knew about cold water already and it was mm-hmm. my savior. You know, cold showers, ice barrels, you know, I lived in northern California for a big chunk of when I was really taking my healing to another level and mm-hmm. it was very easy to find um cryo chambers and float tanks and right. you know, natural springs and so that became the fun adventure to focus my brain on rather than the pain. So, and then as far as like movement and exercise, this, this takes what I, the last statement I made and takes it to a, a whole nother, another place. Mm-hmm. Work with someone who actually knows what they're doing or give yourself time enough to figure it out before you start doing stuff. But you can work out without sweating easily. You can do resistance training without breaking a sweat or having your heart rate elevate at all. Yeah. When you look at typical strength building, and I'm talking not like the 10 to 20 rep range, I'm talking like, like Olympic, yeah, yeah, two two reps with a heavy weight, yeah. gadoosh, gadoosh, yeah. You're, you're done, your heart beats fast, there, there's no sweating, there's no and you, sweat. take a, you take a five minute rest, and you drink cool water, you know, some wonderful yeah. spring water, you go outside, you cool down, you know, you wear the right clothes, like nice baggy cotton or linen or whatever. And and you're just that person that does 10 sets of two on some exercise and you take your darn time and you monitor how you're feeling and and you just you get the job done yeah. in a more creative, creative way. And and then there's also something to to be said about absolute stillness and doing nothing. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes mm-hmm. it, what's needed is just to make yourself comfortable and calm your nervous system down and stop stressing about doing everything yeah. and and about all, all the things that you have to do to heal and just read a read a good book watch a good documentary like talk to that that grandma or that mom or that friend that mm-hmm. makes you feel really good play an instrument for me music has always been an instrument uh, mm. uh, like dance it's been a, an intricate and integral part of my healing process you know when i sit yeah. and play the guitar even though i suck at it it takes me into another universe right yeah. When I'm dancing to electronic music or I'm dancing to African drums, I don't have skin. I don't have a body. It's just this energy ball Mm -hmm. feeling rhythms and moving. And for me, that's what I meant kind of why dance was so therapeutic because I could be moving and grooving and almost like Tai Chi, like cooling my body down while I'm exercising. And also outdoor exercising is great. It's huge. Um, being able to, I mean, that that anti-inflammatory element of the air, if you can get your feet on the dirt, on the earth, um, for those don't, who don't know what I'm talking about, go listen to my talks with Carrie Bennett about the importance of electrons and all that stuff. Here's another question, because this, this occurred to me. So remember how you were saying, your, the shifts happen when you just stopped obsessing yeah. about your skin. I was at a hot springs resort where my husband used to work in Oregon and I was, you know, covered. And finally one day I'm like, okay, I'm going to go out and I'm just going to wear a tank top and I'm not going to cover my skin. Like I had a uniform when my skin was bad. I bought some really nice shirts that, you know, covered my arms, had the collar, And then finally I was like, screw this. I'm just going to go out and I'm going to be okay with how I look. What happened, Rob, is someone saw me and they were, they were like in shock. 
and and their reaction and i'm not mad at them but they were like oh my god what's wrong with your skin and then what happened i went back and covered up again you know because i'm no hero like it hurt and i could actually feel the emotion right now as i say it i'm like damn you i was i was you know and my 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 then fiance was he loved me and didn't care you know he got you know, wanted to get it on, even with all these rashes on my body, which bless his heart, you know, for that. But have you had that experience? Have your students had that? And how do you work with them? Like, what what's the, is there a point where it's just better to actually not expose yourself to the world of people who are very judgy and don't understand that this is a healing process that's happening? Depend, depends on the person. Okay. Totally. And, 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 truly depends on the person there's some people that are going to be absolutely liberated by the two middle fingers in the air and shirt off and like i'm i'm here and i'm flared up and yeah i see you looking at me and it's like you're in my space buddy like deal with it you don't like it shove off you know like some people need to go gangster um other (laughs) other people that wasn't me that wasn't me at all like i was someone who my my ego as a younger person was always connected to my the way i looked you know and it was like hey i liked being muscular and i liked when i when i dude at the gym or out and about like damn man like what do you do for working out like or when a girl would approach me and 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 what her she would give me the body language that she was attracted like that we're human it feels wonderful and i've i've had little kids stare i've had you know people straight up say the same stuff to me like like horrified what is going like What's are you wrong? okay yeah. yeah and and as a ginger person i get i always got a lot of oh bad sunburn like, oh you know like yeah i li- i'm in you know san francisco in the winter bad sunburn yep no. um yeah i i think for for me i i felt much better um with very particular chosen people um, and surrounding myself by other people that were in some level of healing practice. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that that's when I got extraordinarily comfortable with being by myself. Yeah. And it wasn't a poor me, lonely, isolated, I'm so sad. Moments of loneliness, of course. You sure. know, I'm, I'm human. Sure. I, I still have moments of loneliness. I used to have moments of loneliness surrounded by 200 people at ecstatic dance, you know. Yep. It happens, but the overall vibe became like not a control mechanism Mm -hmm. in like a like a harsh way, but a way for me to limit the X factors that I knew would bring me to a bad place. You know, it's like it's like someone who is totally into monogamy and keeps trying to force themselves into polyamorous relationships. It's like, hey, maybe you should just do monogamy. Um, And, you know, that works really good. Like. You know, and I, I had that experience. I was living in the Bay Area and I'm a total old school monogamous loving human being and wanted to this is, you know, this makes sense. And the, like there's nothing wrong with it. It works great for some people. But yeah. for me, it was Didn't like work. trying to fit a circle through a square or a square through a circle. Same thing with healing. You know, yeah. like I felt much better when I could put on my big hat and put on my linen shirt. And mm-hmm. put on my baggy linen shorts mm-hmm. or my linen pants. Yep. Put on my sandals because I had my uniform too. Yeah. Um, and it was cool. like light blue or off white, and it felt it felt cool. Not like yeah. I'm cool, but it was cool. It was cooling. The, it didn't the hurt. Color, yeah, the colors, <laughs> the colors were were calming and cooling. And yeah. I would really try to create my environment to where I knew that I could go outside and take my walks and not be in the right places to not mm-hmm. deal with that. Or if I was going to be in, in public, I learned. And again, being in the Bay area during this time, I was really lucky. There is ashrams and Buddhist temples and places to be around other people who are way more advanced with their, with their beauty and niceness than I was. So yeah. say find safe places and safe people. Yeah. And, and, you know, don't be afraid to, again, create your rituals in your day around exactly what you need. I spent a lot of time in my room mm-hmm. having it the exact way I wanted it, mm-hmm. reading beautiful books or watching mm-hmm. documentaries or hanging out with that single, that one person, person. You know, like you, I had this absolutely wonderful 
African American slash Brazilian girlfriend, and she would I'd be covered in in stuff on my face, and she'd be like, "I don't see it." Like, yeah, yeah you're you're red. You're a red dude. Like, it's, <laughs> like I still want you. And it was like that was so healing for me. It was like, okay, mm-hmm. like here's someone who I'm looking at as this like symbol of perfection you know like this beautiful feminine energy and if she's looking at me with that psh, then the, the noise from the outside and and then the, the third thing and this is maybe a little bit more challenging but also i needed to check in with why other people's reactions matter to me anyway mm-hmm. you know what, what's what's wrong with the person who has never seen that stumbles upon you and they're visceral gut reaction not even out of a bad place it's just like oh my gosh what's wrong shock and and maybe the way their verbiage is harsh because that's the way they are or or maybe that sweet grandma who gave you the smile is actually judging the shit out of you you know you don't (laughs) you don't know so allowing other people to have their reaction and their space Mm -hmm. and their response for me started to make their energy less less important because i'm very empathetic as well and that was a major thing for me was like, oh, man, I can allow these people to see it and feel what they need to feel and have their own response. And mm-hmm. maybe in some twisted, beautiful way, it's giving them a reflection that maybe they're going to go home and be like, maybe I maybe I need to make a change or I don't want to end up like that. And no, not not fun for me in the moment. But hey, net pop. A hundred percent. I want to shift gears to two more things. Um, topical steroids. I use them way too much when I was young. Uh, and I'll share this. I might have shared this in, in another interview I did on my own channel um, with my husband. But when I was at the heat of everything was covered, I couldn't sleep. It was terrible. Screaming in the shower due to pain. I finally went to a der- I never went to a dermatologist. I, there was a part of me, that resistance of me was like, nope, they're going to screw me. They're going to tell me to do this and I don't want to do it. So I finally went and he was a lovely dermatologist. He also was a veterinarian. How's that? You know, medical doctor and a veterinarian. So he had a different energy about him. He was very gentle and he, he did say, I think you should try going on a topical steroid because this is getting out of control. And something about his energy was very different than my GP growing up who said point blank when I was a teenager, Irene, you're always going to have eczema. You had asthma. You had all these things. Da, 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 da. Didn't like that. So I got the prescription and it was getting bad. Like I had only the tiniest bit of skin left on my finger that was white. Everything else was red. Maybe that was from topical steroid with reactions because I wasn't taking them for two and a half years. I don't know. But what I did, Rob, is I, 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 I treated it like a vaccine. He said, put it all over your body. I just put it on the tiniest little patch of skin. Just remember, I just little. The next morning I woke up, my skin was 5% less inflamed. So I titrated it. And um, I haven't touched anything like that in three and a half years um, when I started to do more um, heavy metal detox, and that's a whole other story. But that, that was a use, I think, that was intelligent, and I didn't just take his word for it. I, used, I felt into my own body, how can I use this in a way that is um, safe and isn't going to overload my body with steroids? But I've also seen horrific pictures of people who have been going through topical steroid withdrawal. Can you talk about that and how you've seen this and what your beliefs are on, is there a place? Is there not a place? Yeah, I I think there, I I don't, I'm not hard fast on black and white rules at all. Mm -hmm. I'm not the guy who says, if you work with me, you're going cold turkey off everything. Like, no, like, people have to do this at their own pace. Mm -hmm. I think what's most important is understanding these things as mechanisms and Mm -hmm. and making a choice based on data and like real facts. So Mm -hmm. understanding like, okay, what's the ROI on the steroid creams, the, the symptomatic relief compared to the long-term effects, the, Mm -hmm. the short-term usage versus dude, then I have to heal from the short-term usage. The, 
some people use it and nothing bad happens at all and they heal just fine afterwards and some people use it and it sends Blows things off. into e an even worse place yeah so th the methodology i think is like most of this it's like be very aware and honest and iterate in a, in a way that's based on data mm -hmm. kind of know what you're getting into before you do it M move slowly you know use as little as possible mm -hmm. then let's kind of flip it to the people that have been smothering the strongest stuff on their body for a decade yeah you probably not want to go cold turkey you know like a heroin addict you could die you know yeah. and, and like i'm being a little dramatic but it's true it, it's it's a real withdrawal it is it has overtaken your endocrine system your cortisol mechanism and if your cortisol mechanism is messed up there's no chance your other hormones are even in a decent place mm -mm. so i think a bigger question is and this is something i can't answer because i don't think anyone can is can you heal your hormones while you're still taking it and my assumption is that it's very hard to mm -hmm. and and that's where i think this the true stickiness for me comes in is like when you heal there's going to be a certain level of pain that you go through mm -hmm. each person has to decide where that red line is and when you go over that red line you you gotta do whatever you need to do to to stay alive, to not yep. drive yourself crazy, to be able to actually slightly function. And so if that means you have to continue taking steroid creams, then make that decision for yourself and, and live mm -hmm. with it. And then know that you have some makeup work on the back end to do, and that's just fine. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're someone, you know, this is, this is probably the people I'd like to talk to more with this segment is when you have a teeny tiny bit of eczema on your face or, or on your hand, don't use the shit. No, like, come on. Like guys, if you don't don't be so wrapped up in the way you're looking vanity. that you feel yeah the vanity is gonna nip you in the butt so hard for those people that's when you know Big Brother has to come out and I just have to be like just stop like stop it you know stop it right now cold turkey throw it away lose your dermatologist's number he's your drug dealer look at him that way <laughs> for the other I for the other people it's just wait you just gotta take it. Just understand that the healing timeline is going to take a while. It's mm -hmm. a marathon. Mm -hmm. And so you don't sprint. Mm -hmm. you, you sprint in a marathon, you're done. You're mm -hmm. done, done. You take your time. You get into it. You control all the factors that you can control. You know, these foundational things that we've been mentioning. Focus on those while you slowly limit the amount of creams you're using. And then little by little at some point, you'll be able to get off of them. Stop. And, and, and then... The healing will change and you'll you'll deal with whatever little things come from stopping them but you're already setting the foundation up to be able to to be able to handle that in a, in a much much easier way what i the scary thing that i hear and i've fallen into this too so i'm, I'm talking from a place of experience is i got a flare up so screw it i'm going off i'm drinking the coffee i'm doing the sriracha i'm having the tacos and the burritos and the pizza and all my trigger foods because I'm flared up anyway, so who gives what a What bother? What? Yeah, who cares? Does, it doesn't work, so who cares? And I, I do see that with you know people that are on the steroid creams. And I won't mention her name, obviously, but I have worked with a client before who's recently come back to me. And she has this struggle with when she has these huge flare-ups that aren't really that bad. She goes to the hospital and she gets injections and then she oh. covers herself in steroid creams and takes Oxycontins. And while she does that, she also binges on fast food. Right. And so it's like limit your exposure to all the dangers while you're using the very smart part of Western medicine, because there's some greatness within Western medical. You know, 100%. most people look at me and they're like, you just hate the establishment. It's like, no, I, I don't. I just you have you a know, broken try... bone. You're going to go to the hospital. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> if I get shot in the face, I'm going to get plastic surgery exactly. and I'm going to have a doctor remove that bullet. If I break yeah. my leg, a, a, a surgeon is going to reset that thing. And if this was 2000 years ago, I would probably die because die. I couldn't do anything anymore. So beautiful. But as far as healing, that that's when you, you kind of have to take it more upon yourself and find those doctors like you did, you know, mm -hmm. that there's some great doctors out there that oh, will yeah. be straight with you. And that go so far beyond their education. There's amazing doctors everywhere. So 
I think that it's just move really slowly, you know, move really slowly through, through the process. That pattern of the, 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 the client that you mentioned who would go on that extreme. I mean, to me, colleague to colleague, that's a trauma response. You know, that, that's, yeah. that is, that is a type of, um, dysregulation, which many people have that is not within their awareness and it's instigating a massive fear response. And then the soothing of the food, the correction of the troubles, all those things. And I get, so I get it. Yeah. Um, but I did that. I, I consciously was like, no more cortisone cream. It was September of 2020. It's when I started being very diligent with detoxing using a mineral called zeolite. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I was going to have flares and I watched them come up in the strangest patterns. And it was so different than the eczema or dermatitis or whatever it was 10 years ago that I just was like, okay, this, this needs to come out. And if I mask this, I'm not going to know where that's going back into my body. Huge point, huge, huge, huge point. And this is something that I've, I've debated with colleagues about and mm. other people about. And so it's, it's somewhat controversial, but in my mind, it's, it's not it's at not. all. There's no looking at the symptoms to judge progress with your healing program. Your skin is going to go left, right, up and down, great day, bad day. And guess what? None of it means anything. But what are your biomarkers? And what I'm, a lot of people think biomarkers are like, what is he talking about? Like lab tests? Like, no, just your, what I call your health performance index. Like, are you getting stronger in the gym? Oh, I don't even work out. Okay, there you go. Let's start working out. How is your sleep? And I know it's extraordinarily hard to sleep when you're itchy and feeling yeah. crappy. So that's a tough one. But I also link into sleep. Um, how do you facilitate relaxation and recovery when you're not sleeping? So mm -hmm. that's a part of sleep. Yeah. Digestion, um, overall inflammation that's not associated with your skin. How do your mm -hmm. joints and your hips and your ankles feel? Exactly. Headaches, runny nose. And here's, here's some big ones. Sex drive, uh -huh. hormones, yeah. um, and your enjoyability of life. Are you on razor's edge, irritable? Mm -hmm. depressed, mm -hmm. you know, or, or, mm -hmm. or, or have you been doing something and your skin's not budging, but all of a sudden you're like, Hmm, like I'm in a good mood. Something's different. Way more, way more often. Like, yeah. and wait, like the skin that I do have, that's not flared up. It looks cooler. It's that's, it looks different. Oh, yeah. okay. So the non flared up areas, the whites of the eyes, yeah. the tongue, yeah. the armpits, some people have rashy armpits. I yeah. did, but whatever area that that's not affected, you can really see things changing within your skin. Mm -hmm. And so when I, when I have people, and this is, I think one of the hardest things, cause it's totally counterintuitive that's one of the things I beat a dead horse with is we don't care about symptoms anymore. I know that's not what you want to hear, but my symptoms lasted yeah. until month 11.7 yeah. and then we're gone forever. And yeah. if I would have been watching my symptoms, I would have been that meme of the gold miner who's one inch from the golden nugget and turns around because I've been at it too long. You right. know, it's the systemic changes. And that's the piece that um, can make some people go a little hairy carry in their brain because they've been doing it for so long, as you've said. But I always say, I, I kind of have this image of parallel lines. It's like, well, if everything is inching forward with, as you said, digestion, energy, sleep, interest in the world, blah, 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 that's progress. And it's almost like you said up until, you know, month 11.7. And then there's literally this tipping point. It's kind of like that people will say when your hormones are really uh, crashing, you know, the, the thing, things will wait to really show up like hair loss, you know, like everything's kind of bad, but the, it, the, some things are still sticking. And then all of a sudden one day, everything just breaks down. So it's the same, it's the reverse with healing. As you're healing, it takes time for all these little things to add up. And um, I, yeah, I just, we're in the same boat, Rob. It's like, I cannot say to people enough, the symptoms suck. They do. <laughs> yeah, they do.
And that's where you have to have that trust that the body does not want to be dysregulated and it doesn't want to be living in an inflammatory response. No, not at all. I, I, this drives my medical friends crazy, even the language I use around it, but I, I do it on purpose because it's a, just a very cartoon clear way of looking at it. And mm. I call it the, the pathology ladder. So the gut biome, mm -hmm. the filtration organs, mm -hmm. those start to get better. The hormones turn back on. Yep. Hormones turn back on. The immune system starts to wake up. Immune system starts to wake up. Nervous system starts to wake up. Nervous system starts to wake up. Autonomic nervous system inflammatory response root issue starts to flicker. And when that flicker turns back on or turns back off, then the healing symptomatically happens rapidly. Yeah. Now, to work your way up the pathology ladder is not going to happen in 30 days or three months. Years. It's most likely going to take a, a long while. But mm -hmm. each lat prong of the ladder, you make it up, something in your life that you can obviously notice changes. And mm -hmm. those are the little wins that you got to, you got to look out for and go, okay, cool. Like, wait a second. I am, my, I didn't have sex drive at all. And yeah. now I have sex drive. Like the amount of women that come to me who are like, yeah, you know, we, we've given up on wanting kids and I just, I just want to heal my skin. And then six months later, they're like, oh, I'm pregnant. Pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and at ages that you think you couldn't have babies too. That's the other thing that is a big misnomer is that you're done by yeah. the time you're 35. I'm like, what? No, that's not true. No, it's, that's definitely, definitely not true. And you're seeing that that's one of the cool things I love about, and I don't love the word biohacking. And I think the longevity world is, is can be confusing and, and mm -hmm. weird, but it's also qu quite interesting when you are seeing people pushing the envelope far enough to where, okay, like I read about a woman who just had twins at 55 and she's like, Oh, I'm, I'm going to have more kids. Like I'm, yeah. I'm good. I'm needed more kids. Like I, my body's telling me and it's like, more. damn, that's freaking yeah. like, I love that. Cause it spits in yeah. the face of the accepted narrative. Yeah, it's true. It's a hundred percent true. So for those that haven't had babies yet and they're 40 or 45 or even 50, you never know. You never know. I want to I want to end our talk on food. Someone asked a question because I I didn't get many and I lost some of the Instagram comments to be honest. I didn't catch them when they came in, but one I remember was I've heard and this is from an ND friend, a naturopathic doctor friend who's also a good friend. And he said skin problems are definitely one of the toughest ones for him to work with in his in his practice, but he has seen massive improvements when people go carnivore and yeah. I've spoken about carnivore. The question he had, what happens if that person goes off of that diet, but they still continue to eat whole clean foods? Is it, my sense is it's very individual, but have you seen a trend? Yeah, I've, I've seen everything from the Michaela Peterson archetype where it's like you eat lettuce and you're screwed. Yeah. Um, you know, like you're literally, literally, yeah, yeah. literally like ruminant animals and salt and, and, and I don't even think she does butter. I think it's like spring water, beef, lamb, salt. salt. I think that's her, her diet and she deviates at all and it's full blown symptomatic relapse and she had yeah. horrible stuff like replace hip replacement, the eczema, this everything. I, yeah. I, I see, I see people like that who go strict carnivore and it just it obviously works from the get go. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm a cool test subject cause I healed my skin while vegan and then mm. vegan, I had to recover from being vegan and I used an animal based diet to do that. So I'm pretty well versed with both, mm. both worlds. I didn't know that. Also, I didn't, that that's interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm pretty, I have a lot of experience, eight years vegan and now I'm six years animal based and people do still throw me kind of in like, Oh, you're the carnivore guy. And I'm like, I mean, I don't use dogmatic labels for my diet. Yeah. Like I, I eat a lot of animal fats and animal proteins, probably 95% of my diet, but mm -hmm. I, I eat some of the forbidden carnivore foods. I eat, I eat broccoli sometimes. Oh, I did too last week. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I love it and it, it tastes really good, yeah. especially with like raw goat cheddar on it from my neighbor's, you know, goats. It's, whew, that's, some, oh, and that's when some it's delicious fresh broccoli. Stuff. 
Yeah. It, it's you can't eat broccoli from a store after you have it off of someone's garden within that no. d- day and, or two. And, and that's a whole another part of the conversation. I yeah. think the part of the carnivore diet that leads to so many people having very simple success is that even low quality beef is not much of a trigger food for an autoimmune disease. It has saturated fat, cholesterol, amino acids, and it's pretty similar no. to the same profile as what we're made out of. Yeah. I, I And you really are eliminating all the possible issues with plant foods that there are. And there are many issues with plant foods. I, I wish there wasn't. I wish it was as simple as eat whole foods, we're good to go. And 50 years ago, that probably was the case, you know, but now because of our food systems and our, the degeneration of the soil, and if I want to get too far down the rabbit hole, like, you know, like okay. glyphosate and, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the people who are producing our foods are not nice people, mm-hmm. you know, the, the people who own agriculture right now are, are not okay people. Like they're not the corporations. Pure. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. It's, it's, it's bad. You follow the money back far enough and it is two groups that own 90% of real estate, 90% of agriculture, 90% of the pharmacy companies and 90% of the, the food companies, literally Vanguard and BlackRock. Mm-hmm. There you go. I said it. Mm-hmm. That's okay. reversing, reversing <laughs> back from my tinfoil hat. Um, ah, that's all good. I, I think that what I see, and this is kind of what I really try to teach people is when you use the biomarker system and really that's just a fancy way of saying you ask your body your body what it wants slowly and it will mm-hmm. literally tell you so if you're someone mm-hmm. who starts carnivore and you have amazing results i see just as many people who after three months or six six months or a year can then introduce okay raw dairy cool they get a good source of raw dairy and they're like oh it works it works great awesome open up a whole new plethora of food mm-hmm. oh locally grown vegetables like all of them there seem to work great. Oh my God, I can eat rice. This is yeah. awesome. Yeah. You know, and you just kind of go food group by food group yeah. and methodically ask your body and the body will give you the perfect, perfect, truthful answer. Mm-hmm. Um, and, 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 and it's really that straightforward. Yeah. Um, how many people though do I work with who start that testing process and doesn't really matter what they eat besides maybe a few different types of animal foods. You know, mm-hmm. I also see a lot of people that can eat turkey and can eat chicken and mm-hmm. can eat pork and can eat seafood, mm-hmm. um, but can't touch plants, even fruit. You know, I know Paul Saldino is um, on his mm-hmm. own on his own thing. He's had some eczema issues. Mm-hmm. Um, he is, a, 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 I have countless young men and young women coming to me saying, well, I'm eating the Paul Saldino diet. I should be cured. I'm like, well, it's, you know, like, I, I, if I ate that amount of carbohydrates in a day and that amount of maple syrup and honey, like, and ate 4,000 calories, I'd, I'd weigh 220, you know, right. like I, I, um, I eat two meals a day, sometimes three, and it, it's very regimented, but I eat as much as I want. Um, and I, I, to this day, I eat mostly animal foods mm-hmm. and that makes me feel really, really good. And while I was eating plant foods, it was the most challenging, convoluted, stressful thing to figure out what I could eat. And at the end of the day, for me, it was like potatoes, sweet potatoes, yams, squash, zucchini, some fruit, and that's about it. And that's no, no, that's no way to live. You know, that's no way to live. No, very little. I mean, the minerals and all the I was a shell of myself. Iron. I was yeah. yeah. I was 159 pounds with. Uh, I was the like for those in the carnivore community or the people that like to joke around about vegans. I was the soy boy poster child. I had no sex drive, like a little pooch belly despite working out all the time. Mm-hmm. Couldn't couldn't gain muscle. Mm-hmm. Wasn't interested in sex. Like 159 pounds at best if I didn't stuff myself more like 145 pounds and I'm, you know, like right now without trying and pretty, you know, vascular and lean, I'm mm-hmm. 180, 180 mm-hmm. pounds with no effort, no it's looking easy. at macros, no bulking or cutting or any of that. I just eat until I'm satisfied. And then when I get hungry again, I eat until I'm satisfied. And, and that happens to give me enough room, like three hours, four hours sometimes before bed. And, and so it's, it, it's just, I don't, it, without any effort, it's just an obviously healthier diet for me. Yep. 
I fall into the same boat. Maybe a little less, but yeah, the, the local seasonal, all our beef is from a rancher that we know really well and it's all clean. Mm. And so I wanted to ask that because it is one of the most confusing topics in general yeah. is diet and diet dogma. And I've talked about it a bit. One, one more thing to add to Please. that. And this is just something that I, that I say often, especially to doctors, because I, I find doctors to be the most fascinating group to talk with about this stuff because they're so darn smart. They're such smart people. Yeah. But in, in many ways they studied a book that tricked the hell out of them. Mm -hmm. You know, like when your new when your PhD level dietitian refers to the book that was written by the two companies that I just told you about, mm -hmm. I have a hard time being mm -hmm. like but, but anyway, no, what I well, what I would say to that doctor ahead. friend is does an obese person have to stay eating healthy the rest of their life to not be obese anymore? Yeah. yeah. So does when someone find a diet that works perfectly for them, changes a disease, reverses a disease and gives them life back? Do they have to eat that food for the rest of their lives? Like why they should. I, I would. Why not? You know, <laughs> I've made I've made the joke that if if I found that donkey hair milkshakes were the thing that that fixed me then i would have no like fine you know that's, that's it fine because five seconds of mouth masturbation is not worth a life of hell and mm -hmm. i luckily i enjoy the hell out of the food that i eat mm -hmm. um, but even if i didn't i could i could make it work and have a discipline through that moment and then live the other 23 and a half hours of my day feeling wonderful yeah yeah, I, I agree. I think that's the way to, to run it. And the, you know, just to piggyback on the medical piece that you mentioned, I don't know if you caught the long podcast interviews that um, Jack Cruz did with Rick Rubin and Andrew Huberman. Did you ever take the time to listen to those? I've seen clips, but that's, that's something that... Um... See, I, I also have to, part of my game with social media is I'm very easily triggered and I'm hot tempered and <laughs> I just kind of avoid most of everything. But that's one that I've been like, okay, I need to circle back and, and like, cause I love Rick Rubin. He's a, he's definitely someone who definitely. he uh, has, has been, I've under like way back in his days with Red Hot Chili Peppers, he was already if you paid attention to him, was already saying all this stuff. He was yeah. already tuned in. Yeah. Yeah. What no, was he, your, what was your take on it? I'd love no, to hear well, it was long. Broad strokes. Uh, it was long. I would listen to it again when I have a bit more time. I did find a document online where someone took notes. Wow. <laughs> it was long. But what Cruz said, uh, and I don't remember the exact context was, most of the medical books and most of the curriculum that you would learn, I think he said 90% of it is inaccurate yeah. in terms of, and, and it was a conversation where Huberman had a colleague or another PhD or an MD who said about 50% is inaccurate and, and Cruz, you know, he's very just, this is it. Nope. 90%. And so of course, yeah. maybe it's somewhere in between, and that I think is what's so interesting to come back to someone like yourself who does not have a medical degree, but mm -hmm. I was looking at your site, the testimonials, the pictures. So for those who want to dive in and see the results and the healing that your students get, please go to Rot. We'll link everything near here and look at these photos um, because the skin stuff is debilitating. I know that. And the medical system, I can say with full force, does not know how to help this area of our body heal. Like you said, if it's a burn victim that needs plastic surgery, totally different, totally different. But this is a systemic issue that is a result of so many factors that isn't one, which means that ladder that you mentioned, I love, that's such a great image to know that this is an ongoing healing process that from what I can tell, I haven't worked with you, but I think working with you would be fun. I, tr I, try, to, I try to make, I try, I, I'm lucky. I, I work with people who I vibe with. So yeah. I don't, 
I don't ever have to. And, and I just can't anyway. I, I, I am me and mm-hmm. it's a good social filter. Um, I love the, my students. They're the, they're the bomb. Like most yeah. of them become people who text me and email me years after that we've worked together just to be like, Oh, I caught this giant fish or, Oh, I'm <laughs> building my own tiny home or like, yeah. you know, and, and I love working with people. It's so fun for me. Like truly, what what keeps me in this game is like the platform and the social media stuff is an interesting puzzle but it's kind of gross to be a part of i have to say honestly i love long form podcasts they have been they're like books to me like mm-hmm. they're there to to social media what like books are to you know hollywood movies like you're, you're just gonna get so much more depth or a trash so, magazine <laughs> right it, exactly and it, but the thing that hits my heart and fills me with motivation and and when i'm having my own mental battle with do i keep doing this have i made my point like my offerings are out there i have a, over a thousand videos like should I step away from this and do something, you know, more profitable and easier and more fun? Then I get the the text from someone that I've never met who says, dude, like check out these before and afters. Like I used to be absolutely depressed. I couldn't get out of bed. And now I'm a marketing agent in New York City and have a six pack like, like, oh, my God, I'll, I'll end with this story because it's Please. It's the best example. And he knows if he listens to this, which he probably does because he listens to everything. <laughs> there's a dude that seven months ago joined our online program. And, and God bless his heart. He's been at every single live Zoom call that we do. Every single one. And I kid you not, the first time that he turned his camera on and we're all sitting there on Zoom, it was like someone sitting in a dark room with a hooded sweatshirt on, barely see his face. And it was like, and he was making comments like, that doesn't work. Like, that's bullshit. Like, no, that I've tried that. It doesn't work. I was like, okay, I'm really going to have to like hold space and redirect. Aww. And like, yeah, last week he comes to the meeting. Actually, it was this week, Monday. Um, bright lit up room his landscaping business sweatshirt on big, strong jaw, curly, long hair, buffer than looks like a linebacker and sitting back in his chair, like this sassy, witty boy, like just, you know, like it, introducing the new people like, yeah, come in. No, you press mute here and just, yeah, just raise your Aww. hand. You're good. Like, and everyone notices it. And even he notices it. And it's like, that's what this is all about. Like, we talked about in the beginning, like, yeah, maybe the skin can fully cure or maybe you can get to the place where like, yeah, you have a little teeny tiny flare up once in a while that you have total control over and it doesn't mess your life up and you get that type of energy, you know, yeah. like, yeah. And, and for me, that's why I'll probably do this until I, until I'm totally done. I think that's a good idea. Thanks so much. This has been fun. Has been fun. Thanks for having me. It's been uh, wonderful connecting. I don't I don't get to connect with uh, enough people in our genre because there's some interesting things out there. Um, so it's <laughs> nice to see, really nice to see, and I appreciate the work that you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, it actually gives me a lot of hope, to be honest. Like, okay, this is this is a community that is really really moving in a better direction than yeah. it, than it was. Yeah. Uh, you know in the past. So I thank you for your work. Thank you for allowing me to, to chat on your platform and hopefully we can, you know, really get this message out to everybody. You know, I hope, here's what I really hope. I hope that in 10 years from now, the narrative for doctors has gone from, you can't cure that. You take drugs forever to, Oh no, like you don't even need to come see me. Just take this course online. You'll be good. (laughs) Like that's you're. it's fine. Not that big of a deal. You're good. Let it be so. Yeah, let it be so. Amen. Thanks so much, Rob. Thank you.